Drew Timmy's gone. St. Mary's and Gonzaga actually shared the regular season crown last year. Will this be the first year since 2011-12 that someone other than Gonzaga stands alone atop the West Coast Conference? You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. No is the answer, by the way. Hey there, welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast. We are your hosts. That's my guy, Andy Patton. I'm Isaac Shade. We want to thank you for making Locked On College Basketball your first listener watch every day to get everything you need about your teams, which today is the nine teams of the West Coast Conference. This episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. A championship team is about each player being a perfect fit. Same with your vehicle. So for parts that fit, head to eBay Motors and look for the green check. Stay in the game with eBay Guaranteed Fit. eBayMotors.com. Let's ride. eBay Guaranteed Fit. Only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Folks, we are continuing our conference preview series where we preview every single college basketball conference, all 32 of them, including full shows about the Power Six conferences, the A-10, AAC, Mountain West, and today's conference, the West Coast Conference, about which Andy knows absolutely nothing. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Andy, happy birthday, buddy. We missed you on Monday. I hope you had a great weekend celebrating with friends and family. And as a reward, we get to talk about the conference you probably know better than any, the West (laughs) Coast Conference. So, Andy, get us right into this. What do you see as the biggest storyline for the West Coast Conference in 23-24? Yeah, I think there's kind of two really big ones. Of course, BYU departing the conference. It goes from a 10-team conference to a 9-team conference. BYU was uh, in the conference for a decade, had quite honestly a lot less success than they, I think, anticipated that they would have uh, when they joined the conference. I think it's hard for people to remember that in 2011, which isn't even that long ago, Gonzaga was not even close to the powerhouse that they have become since then. And BYU kind of thought, okay, we're, we're coming off the Jimmer Fredette era. And, we, you know, they were a three seed in the NCAA yeah. tournament. They beat Gonzaga in that tournament. And I kind of thought, I think they kind of came in thinking we're going to you know run the table in this conference, be a, a perennial NCAA tournament team. And it just never happened. And part of it was Gonzaga, you know, by 2013, they were the number one ranked team in the country for the first time ever. That started to become borderline routine for them. Randy Bennett and St. Mary's climbed up in a significant way. And BYU just kind of never really took that leap. They did make some tournaments. They did upset Gonzaga some key times. And they they created a, a better conference for the WCC, unquestionably. But it wasn't exactly the tenure that I think they expected to have. Now they're, of course, in the Big 12, and we'll see how that goes for them. I think it's going to be a pretty rough adjustment from a men's basketball perspective as they start to get some better recruits in. I think things will turn around for them, but it's it, it's going to be probably pretty rough for a few years. So I think that's kind of the big one. And then beyond that is kind of what you alluded to at the beginning there. Gonzaga has been the team running this conference, and St. Mary's has been right on their heels, but they haven't actually clipped them all that much. But coming into this this upcoming season, Gonzaga is replacing a huge chunk of their starting lineup, including Drew Timmy, who's legitimately impossible to fully replicate with one player. It's just not going to happen. Uh, and St. Mary's brings back basically everybody. They lose Kyle Bowen, but they got Aiden Mahaney back, Mitchell Saxon's back, Alex Dukas is back, and, and you're kind of looking at a team that – might actually be a bit more favored going into this this season than Gonzaga. I think they're kind of right one and two, one A, one B, as it were. But it's it's going to be as hard as it's been for Gonzaga to win both the regular season and the WCC championship because of how good that St. Mary's team is. Andy, something I, I want to go back to the first thing about BYU and just mention one thing in passing is I think the struggles they had try asserting dominance when maybe mm-hmm. they thought they would, I think is less about BYU and more about the uh, the West Coast Conference yeah. being a better conference. Yeah. I, I think most people that are outside the Pacific Northwest mm-hmm. look at the WCC and they're like, oh, that's Gonzaga and a bunch of phonies. Mm-hmm. This is a phenomenal conference, folks. And so mm-hmm. if you're a East Coaster or a Midwester, uh, that's <laughs> not a thing, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> you need to know this is a legit conference. Finished mm-hmm. ninth at Ken Palm last year and is really really good it is not just mark fuse bulldogs and mm-hmm. if you if you've missed out on someone like aiden mahaney at saint mary's mm-hmm. you got to get your eyes on this conference so yeah. but then andy going forward to what what you went to after that about gonzaga's dominance mm-hmm. of the conference and, and somebody else getting up to it i mean it's been literally 
every conference championship regular season since uh, 2000, 2001 has mm-hmm. been Gonzaga either winning or sharing or St. Mary's winning or sharing. Literally yeah. the only one in there is Gonzaga and Pepperdine shared 01, mm-hmm. 02, and Pepperdine won outright in 99, 2000. That's it. That's it. And so we're, we're starting to look at what, what, what is Gonzaga post Drew Timmy? I think mm-hmm. that really curious to look at is Graham EK going to be healthy enough to dominate in the way we think he should be able to uh can Watson take the massive step forward that that he needs to what just what is that going to look like I think we feel comfortable that Ryan Nemhard can step right in and do the job and we know some of the other pieces Mm -hmm. but if if those things don't come together and I think that's it that if that question mark that we haven't had since Mm -hmm. before Drew Timmy was there and and multiple other bigs before him and so that's what I think, why I think gives us some of this pause. Yeah. And so that, that's what I'm looking at. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think you, you look at Gonzaga this year and it's just, it's not that there's a lack of talent. It's not that there is a, a we haven't con- seen it together. Yeah, exactly. It's just unproven. And it's not, I mean, Ryan Nembhardt is of course very proven in his two years, but he's going to be adjusting to a different offense. I yes. think there's, there's little reason to doubt his ability to, seamlessly run a Gonzaga offense because of this, the style of play that he already has shown. But outside of that, I mean, the wing position is a huge question mark. Uh, you have Steel Venters coming in from Eastern Washington, talented, but he's more of a sharpshooter and kind of doesn't bring a whole lot else. EK's health is a question mark. And then the bench depth is a, is a significant question as well. So I don't think Gonzaga's in danger of any serious regression outside of like, you know, I think they will be a top 25 team. I think they're going to make certainly going to make the NCAA tournament as a top five seed. I think the sweet 16 streak is probably still alive, although you never know what's going to happen in the big dance, but, uh, but there is question about whether they're going to win the conference uh, more than there ever has been because of how good St. Mary's is. And I think that uh, that is the biggest thing kind of facing this conference right now is that uh, it might not be Gonzaga even in a tie, like they may outright lose the conference. It could happen. I'm still favoring them barely, but Randy Bennett has had their number uh, in the past. And they, Randy Bennett and St. Mary's have beaten better Gonzaga teams than this one uh, in the past. Well, Andy, you just mentioned it. Gonzaga, St. Mary's. Those are the two teams we think are at the top of this above everyone else. The WCC has been a multi-big, multi-bid NCAA tournament league every tournament since 2019. Uh St. Mary's and Gonzaga, 2019, no tournament in 20. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gonzaga and BYU in 21. Gonzaga, St. Mary's, and San Fran in 22. And then last year, Gonzaga and St. Mary's. We expect, yes, a multi-bid league. Again, Mm -hmm. unless just something weird happens, both those teams are in the dance. Like, no question. My question, though, is, is there a third team that can rise up and join them this year in the field of 68? See, the hard part about that is that the reg- the conference regular season has lost a quality opponent in BYU. That's right. And I think that that is a challenge for a team like San Francisco, a team like Santa Clara, a team like LMU, all teams that I think on paper have rosters that could contend to be NCAA tournament teams. The WCC is the most unforgiving league in the entire country in terms of trying to get an at-large bid. I don't think there's almost any debate about that. Mid-major teams that don't finish top two in the conference rarely, 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 rarely get NCAA tournament bids. And the odds of finishing top two in a conference with Gonzaga and St. Mary's is nearly impossible. San Francisco did it. They did it barely. And they had to be nearly perfect in the non-conference. They still got a 10 seed when they probably deserved a bit of a higher seed in terms of their net ranking and and Ken Mm. Palm ranking. Uh, They got a a first round matchup against Murray State, which was an absolute crime against the college basketball gods. (laughs) That game went into overtime and was like the most exciting game in the entire tournament. And the fact that somebody had to lose that game, which it was San Francisco, was very frustrating. But for me this year, I think that San San Francisco, St. Mary, or excuse me, San Francisco, LMU, and Santa Clara are all as good as they've been for the last half decade or so. But not having a couple games against BYU and having those games be replaced by an extra game against somebody like Pacific or Pepperdine or San Diego is going to hurt those teams in a way where I've looked at their non-conference schedules. San Francisco is the only one that I think has enough quality opponents on there. Where if they are on a heater and they beat Arizona State, and they beat some of those other teams on the schedule, maybe they can sneak their way in, but I wouldn't be betting on it this year. And that's what you get when you have that 
16 team. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's been 16 conference games now for several years, yeah. but now it's true home and home round Robin. That's what we're looking at. Well, let's talk about who is going to win the tournament. Is it going to be Gonzaga? Is it going to be St. Mary's? We also got some coaching changes and or some non-coaching changes who might be on the hot seat, as well as some tier discussions to have here on the WCC. All of that coming up. After a word from today's sponsor, DoorDash. Are you missing the syrup for your pancakes? Or did you just run out of your favorite coffee creamer with DoorDash's grocery delivery? You can get what you want right when you need it. You've trusted DoorDash to deliver your restaurant favorites, and now you can get your favorite groceries delivered as well. With thousands of grocery stores to choose from, you'll find the best in your neighborhood and boost your local economy in the process. You will get exactly what you ordered or DoorDash is going to make it right. So sit back and enjoy quality groceries just like you picked them yourself. And if you want even more value, you can save on all of your grocery and restaurant favorites with a $0 delivery fee on all eligible orders with a Dash Pash membership. With easy substitutions right in the app and best-in-class customer support, DoorDash delivers groceries exactly how you want them. Get 50% off your first DoorDash order up to a $20 value when you use code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE at checkout. Limited time offer, terms do apply, but that is 50% off up to $20 and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter promo code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE. That's code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE for 50% off your first order with DoorDash. Folks, college football season is here. We are getting into the conference slate of games, and Locked On is kicking up our coverage with the Locked On College Football Kickoff Live, airing each Friday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern on every single Locked On College YouTube channel. College Football Kickoff Live will cover playoff implications, conference rivalry games, and go in-depth like only Locked On can, including insight and analysis from our stable of Locked On College hosts covering their teams every single day. Find the Locked On College Football Kickoff Live every Friday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern Time on any Locked On College YouTube channel. You will not want to miss it. Isaac, we are still here covering the West Coast Conference on Locked On Zags. I frequently call these WCC Wednesdays. So happy we managed to make it work here on a Wednesday for you all. (laughs) We got some coaching stuff to talk about in the WCC, some coaches who might be on the hot seat. Also want to talk about kind of the tier rankings of the teams in the WCC. But before we get into that, one of the more interesting things, one of the storylines we didn't quite get to there in segment one about the WCC has been the fact that We've seen a lot of players drafted out of the WCC the last couple of years who didn't go to Gonzaga, who didn't go to St. Mary's. And I don't think that that happens all of that often. Santa Clara has had two of them. Jalen Williams was drafted 12th a couple of years ago. Brandon Pajemski was drafted 19th last year. We haven't seen Pajemski make his NBA debut yet, but boy, howdy, did Jalen Williams make a name for himself with the Oklahoma City Thunder, one of the most prolific rookie seasons uh, from a mid-major player in a very long time, certainly a guy who already looks like he deserved to get picked much higher than he did. Max Lewis came out of Pepperdine last year as well, was drafted 40th overall but the main question i have for you is do you think we're going to continue to see this because we we've been talking about how the wcc is better than people give it credit for and one way to really establish that is to put dudes in the league (laughs) like that really helps when you can establish that hey there is nba level talent playing in this league and santa clara has had two top 20 picks in the last two years that is pretty definitive proof that they are playing at a level capable of, of being in the big dance and playing with the big boys because you know, Jalen Williams doesn't look like somebody. He looks like somebody who could play on every single team, NBA or college in the entire country. So I'm wondering if you think there's anybody else who might be able to sneak into some of those conversations and help kind of keep the WCC uh, in, in those conversations as one of the better conferences that people aren't given a lot of credit for. Yeah, Andy, it's wild when you say like, all right, each of the past two years, there's been a top 20 NBA draft pick out of the West Coast Conference. Oh, and by the way, they're both from Santa Clara. Right. Like, she didn't make the NCAA tournament, you know? <laughs> like, like what on mm-hmm. earth? And But when you start to look at it and it's like, oh, well, it's Herb Sendek. Herb Sendek, who was at NC State, he knows how to pick him at the ACC level. Herb Sendek, who, oh, by the way, was at Arizona State with some guy that had a really big beard that's done okay for himself <laughs> in the NBA by the name of James Harden. And so, obviously, Herb Sendek has this great track record of just finding these guys – putting them in the right space and, and and helping them figure out how do I best succeed. And so I, I don't think it is all that like 
this is the most random thing, right? Like, I think mm -hmm. there's something to it. So if I'm looking at two guys, specifically on Santa Clara's team this year, who might be able to do it, one is Adama Ball, who is an Arizona transfer. I think both from like an injury and readiness standpoint wasn't quite there, mm -hmm. but he has to me, like the, the type of body that could be ready for the NBA, uh, you know, just getting it in shape and all of that stuff. So he's somebody to watch at Santa Clara this year. And then the other is Jalen Benjamin, who spent two years at UAB, two years at Mount St. Mary's. He's a little bit of an undersized guard, but I think once again, with Herb Sendek's direction, helping him really utilize what he's best at. I mean, those are the two guys, like if we're talking, it's got to be Santa Clara that I would see making that kind of jump similar to what Brandon Pajemski did last year. Yeah, I think uh, there's, there are a handful of non-Santa Clara guys, although I will toss out Christoph Tilly. I don't know that he's necessarily like a, a, a high-level NBA pick because he's a seven-foot center who doesn't stretch the floor. Is he Killian's he's brother, by the way? No, he's, it's spelled differently. Is it? Or not. Okay. Yeah, I know. I it seems, yeah. It, yeah, it seems surprising. But um, he's a guy that I think could be on that radar as well. And then there's Javon Porter coming out of Pepperdine. Javon Porter is probably the, the most notable NBA draft prospect uh, maybe in the entire conference, perhaps certainly of the non Gonzaga St. Mary's teams. I would um, agree. I would agree. I would say whole conference. Honestly. Yeah, I think whole conference. He's a, a stretch four guy. He's a younger brother of Michael Porter Jr., who, of course, is a very prolific NBA player with the Denver Nuggets. So uh, Lorenzo Romar, which is what we're going to kind of transition into here. Romar has done a very good job of bringing in high level talent. Like we said, Maxwell Lewis was an NBA draft pick last year. Houston Millette is one of the best guards in the entire or in the entire conference uh, this season. They also have Javon Porter, but. Pepperdine hasn't won a lot of games. Uh, in fact, uh, they haven't won. They, I think they back to back years with single digit wins right, entirely. That's right. Seven three, and nine. Yeah. The last years. Three combined WCC wins uh, in the last couple of years. Like this team has not been good. Lorenzo Romar has a multi decade history of bringing in talented players because he is a great recruiter and not winning a lot of games. This is what happened at Washington. It's not surprising that it's also what's happening at Pepperdine. And we're talking about a conference, one of three conferences in the country, Isaac, that didn't have a single coaching change last year. No. Wow. And Mark Few's been there since 1999. Randy Bennett has been there since 2001. Uh, none of the other coaches are quite that tenured, but Herb Sendak has been there for a while. Like there is a lot of uh, really solid coaches in a conference where it's really hard to coach if you aren't at Gonzaga and St. Mary's. Uh, and now we see this conference kind of run it back with the same group this year, but I don't know that they're going to run it back with the same group the next year. And I think Lorenzo Romar is certainly the most obvious hot seat candidate, but if you're Pepperdine and you're getting talented players and you're sending guys to the league and you're in a conference where it's really hard to win games because you're not Gonzaga or St. Mary's, how much do you, like how, how picky are you going to be? I guess is the question. Like Romar might just be able to, he's an alum. Uh, he might just be able to hold on to that job, even if the program is, is not doing well, but three wins in two years, if, if they stay that bad, they're going to have to make a move. By the way, for Javon Porter, this man, he watched Michael go to go off to Mizzou to Columbia, mm -hmm. Missouri. And he was like, yeah. nah, bro, I'm going to Malibu for yeah. college. <laughs> <laughs> hard, hard to blame him there. I don't mind losing a bunch of basketball games <laughs> if it means I can hang out in Malibu. Andy, let's let's look at the the conference kind of hierarchy mm. uh, in that way, and and we're gonna break this down into tiers so we can look at like how this really breaks apart. I, and so we've broken this down, folks, into four tiers for you. I think it's a no brainer because we've already been talking about it. That mm -hmm. that top tier, it's Gonzaga and St. Mary's. No mm -hmm. one else is in that conversation. In fact, I think it's a pretty wide chasm from tier Huge one gap. to tier yeah. two. Um, but Andy, beyond those two, who who are we putting in tier two? Yeah, tier two to me is, is this is kind of where BYU fit. BYU was almost like a tier right. one point five type of thing because <laughs> they were a little bit below. But uh, to me, it's LMU, it's Santa Clara, and it's San Francisco, and it, it's been fairly consistently for the last really decade, at least half decade for sure, where where teams three through five tend to fall in that group. It was four through six when BYU was there, but there is a, a gap between those teams and the rest of the conference in my mind. And I think you could kind of order them any different way. But to me, those three schools kind of stand out as the group below Gonzaga and St. Mary's and kind of above the bottom half of the league. Yep. And then moving into tier three, obviously we got four teams left. I've got mm -hmm. Uh, there's three more P teams. I've got two of them in tier three and that's Portland. I feel better about 
Yeah. Pepperdine less so. I mean, a lot of that is what you just said. Yeah. Seven wins and nine wins each of the last mm -hmm. two years. Yeah. But I just think when you have somebody that is such an NBA talent, like yeah. so often we look back at teams and it's like, why was that Lehigh team so good? <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, CJ McCollum, exactly. stuff like that. And so I think he is going to be able to do enough to help Pepperdine mm -hmm. rise up above the fourth tier. And so I, I've got Pepperdine and Portland in tier three. Yeah, and then you got to kind of close it out with Pacific and San Diego. Pacific has kind of been the bottom feeder of the conference really since they joined the conference. Uh, it's been they, we haven't really seen them take that jump. Damon Stoudemire was kind of the best of that era for them when he was the head coach, and he led them to some 500 records despite having sanctions against the program that were there from before his tenure. But since then, we just haven't seen this team take a leap. And San Diego, we we touched a little bit on Steve Lavin being the, the head coach there now in his second year. Uh, but they were really, really bad last year. I think Lavin's probably going to get them kind of right in the ship a little bit. But until we see it, they kind of sit at the bottom for me right now. Agreed. So, Andy, we come to the moment. We've asked the question, is this the year that a non-Gonzaga team, which really could only be St. Mary's, mm -hmm. apologies to the other seven, <laughs> uh, knocks off Gonzaga? Let's go with our regular season champs. Andy, who do you have? I'm going with Gonzaga. I think the main reason for it is that St. Mary's, I think, is more susceptible to losses to some of those middle teams. And I know Gonzaga lost to LMU last year, and I know they needed a buzzer beater to beat San Francisco. And it certainly could happen this year with, you know, Sands, Drew, Timmy. But to me, St. Mary's plays such a slow, methodical style, and they're great defensively. And they're, but their, their offense is predicated on being like, insane levels of efficiency and it's hard to do that every single night and I think they're a little bit more likely to drop a game to a to a San Francisco to an LMU to a Santa Clara maybe even to a Portland uh, than Gonzaga is and the, the separation between these two teams is probably going to be one or two games and I think there's just enough belief that St. Mary's can't quite do it for every single night the way that Gonzaga can. I agree with you I, I think Mitchell Saxon is such a good eraser mm -hmm. in the interior but I, like not enough people are talking about how big a deal losing Logan Johnson is, right? Yeah. Like, I, I think him not being there, that backcourt with he and Aiden Mahaney, man, it was so yeah. dynamic last year, able to, to do that on a night in mm -hmm. and night out basis. Is it Mahaney himself? Who can, if anyone, mm -hmm. step into that role? And so because of that, and I think Mark Fuse just always able to get these guys together, give me mm -hmm. Gonzaga as the regular season champs. But Andy, is it the same in the WCC tournament? I believe it was it two years ago. St. Mary's knocked off Gonzaga in the tournament in the uh, WCC tournament. They Ooh. do it every couple of years. They yeah. do it every couple of years, and, and frankly, I think they're going to do it this year. Uh, I think, do you? I, I think St. Mary's going to win the WCC tournament in Vegas. Um, and and the reasoning is is basically while I think the St. Mary's team may have their ups and downs, and they may have their adjustment period without Bowen, without Logan Johnson. I think they're going to they're going to have it figured out by then, and they'll have played Gonzaga twice. And I don't know that they will have. I don't know. I don't think they'll be 0 and 2 against Gonzaga. I think they'll probably split the regular season. But to me, last year, Gonzaga absolutely stomped on them in the WCC tournament, which was startling. I don't know if anybody expected them to blow them out as Especially much. Especially after did. the regular season game. Exactly. Um, but I don't, I think they're going to be out for blood. I don't think they want to get embarrassed in Las Vegas again. And I think that Mahaney is going to be improved as a sophomore. I think they have enough defense with Saxon down low with some of the guys on the, on the wing, like Marcelonis and of course, Dukas. And I yep. think that again, they do this every couple of years. This Gonzaga team doesn't have the star power that they've had in the past. They're going to be a little bit more balanced. I think St. Mary's is going to find ways to kind of prevent them from doing what they want to do. And I think if you're taking one championship game for all the marbles, I think St. Mary's is going to take it. Ooh, I like it. I'm actually going to stick with Gonzaga for the tournament championship as well. Um, Andy, I'm sorry you don't have enough faith in the Bulldogs there. <laughs> but um, like a lot of conference tournaments, I worry about a lack of depth, kind of like yeah. I, I'm, I think Gonzaga might have a little bit of that this year, but not so in the West Coast tournament where you only, what, you play two games, yeah. the semifinals <laughs> and the finals to win. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm not worried about depth in that scenario. Give me the Bulldogs bringing home that automatic qualifier, which they're going to need because there's no way they're getting it. No, I'm just kidding. Of course. As an at-large. <laughs> Andy, we got to get to our awards and our predictions. Who's going to be on the first team, all WCC? Who's going to get those other individual awards? All that's coming up in just a second. You are in bated breath waiting in suspense to hear <laughs> our picks. 
We'll get to them in just a second. But first, this episode of Locked on College Basketball is brought to you by Jace Medical. Hey, what would happen if you found yourself cut off from modern medical care and treatment? I'm guessing you wouldn't be prepared. Maybe you're just like me and life's so busy that you don't have time to make a doctor's appointment. Go get a bunch of medicine. You need it on hand. And so if you're like me, you need the Jace case from Jace Medical. The Jace case provides five life-saving antibiotics for emergency use. All it takes to get the Jace case is you fill out a simple form online and then you get prescription life-saving medications delivered right to your door. I love it because the Jace case gives you peace of mind so that you're not just hoping you have access to medication in an emergency. You know that you already have it in hand. So save more than $360 by getting these life-saving antibiotics with Jace Medical, plus an additional $20 off by using our code Locked On at checkout on jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com. Doctor created, doctor recommended. That's Jace Medical. Oh, Andy, it's time to pick that first team all West Coast Conference and listen. This is one of those conferences that has 10 dudes on the first team. I'm not about it. Andy, why on earth does your conference do this? I don't know. But you and I are only making five picks each. Give me yours. Yeah, I got uh, two from Gonzaga, two from St. Mary's. Uh, hard to not make those picks there. I'm going Ryan Nembhard uh, from Gonzaga as well as Anton Watson from Gonzaga. I think they're going to be the two most productive players for that team. I think Watson's going to take that necessary step offensively to put himself in that conversation. And then you got to go Aiden Mahaney and Mitchell Saxon at St. Mary's. Uh, Saxon, I think, is, is a strong candidate for defensive player of the year. He's a great shot blocker, good low post scorer. Aiden Mahaney was absolutely electric last year, and I have no doubt that he's going to take a solid jump as a sophomore. And then I'm going Tyler Robertson, fifth year oh, yeah. senior at the University of Portland, a guy who's kind of followed Coach Shante Leggins around. He was with him at Eastern. He's been at UP the last couple of years. Really productive player, 15 points, five boards, five assists. I think there's he's going to put up similar levels of production in that offense for the pilots, and I think that's going to be enough for him to earn first team nomination. Oh, Andy, I love it. I love it. Now, here's the thing. Looking at this conference, I was like, honestly, my top six picks are all either Gonzaga or St. Mary's players. So <laughs> I self-imposed that I could only pick one player from each team. I so it. I actually took the other Gonzaga player that I think is going to be right at the top, and that's Graham E.K., who we've talked about, again, assuming he's back and healthy, which we always hope for. From mm -hmm. St. Mary's, same as you, I went with Aiden Mahaney. I also have Tyler Robertson. Mm -hmm. So the other two then, Javon Porter from Pepperdine, who we've already been talking about. Yeah, absolutely first team, all West Coast. And mm -hmm. then my other guy, Pepe. Give me a Peppa. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Kelly, Louis, a Pepe from uh, LMU. If for no other reason than that glorious mullet flowing behind him, 13, uh, 13 points, 6.8 rebounds last year as a 6'6 forward. I just expect that to keep rising up this year. Obviously, lots of other great players in this conference, but that is my top five. Andy, out of those five, who is your player of the year? Yeah, I'm going with Mahaney. Uh, sophomore leap is real. We've seen players take that jump from freshman year to sophomore year. Mahaney was already really, really good as a freshman. I think there's going to be a bit more pressure on him offensively, again, without Logan Johnson as that kind of secondary creator in that offense. But I think he's ready for that responsibility. He's ready for that role. He's such a good distributor. He's such a good facilitator, playmaker, outside shooter, driver of the basket. There's not much he doesn't do well. I think this conference is going to be as prepared for him as possible. Uh, he's the guy that teams are, are circling on the scouting report, but I think that's he's still going to do enough to, to take home this award, especially if St. Mary's is continually in that conversation as a top 20 caliber team throughout the year. I've got the exact same thing, so I won't spill any more ink or in this case, <laughs> vocal cord breath on it. Let's move to coach of the year. Andy, I'm going with some dude named Mark Few from Gonzaga, and here's Ooh. why. <laughs> he hasn't he hasn't won this award since 2021. And and mm -hmm. folks, if you're with us all the time, you know we talk about like mm -hmm. how people vote on these coach of the year awards is silly. Yeah. But I think there's gonna be this like, oh, poor, poor Mark Few doesn't mm -hmm. have Drew Timmy anymore. Let's mm -hmm. throw him a bone for winning another yeah. championship. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've got him. If not, I would have Stan Johnson at LMU just yeah. for that constant building. I think it's kind of, would be a little bit of a legacy thing mm -hmm. of like, hey, great job building this program uh, and getting into like that top three or four in the league. I'm going with Chris Gerlison at San Francisco. And again, this friend is of the a, show, friend, yes, of, friend the show. of the show, Chris Gerlison. Uh, for me, I think San Francisco is going to finish third. 
I think they're projected to finish fourth or fifth at a lot of places and going from fourth or fifth to third is not necessarily a huge jump, but I think this team has the talent to legitimately win some games in the non-conference that they might not be expected to win. Typically that's not how you vote for coach of the year, but if, if Chris Gerlofsson is legitimately right on the bubble, which I think is possible, I think he's going to end up taking home this award, especially if they clip one of Gonzaga or St. Mary's. And I think there's a chance that in those four games that they at least win one of them. Uh, and that's often enough to win this award. Yeah, makes a ton of sense to me. Andy, we got three more categories. We got a blaze through them. Coming up next, transfer of the year. Who are you going with, my friend? I'm going with Ryan Nembhard at Creighton, or from Creighton to Gonzaga. Again, we've seen what what a, a Nembhard can do in a Gonzaga-led offense. Ryan's not quite the same as his brother, but in a, in a pick and roll heavy offense without a low post dominant score like Timmy, I he's think faster. Ryan. Boy, yeah, is he faster. He is lightning fast. I think he's <laughs> going to be asked to take on a bigger scoring role than Andrew ever was because Andrew, of course, played with Drew. So I think Ryan's going to put up the kind of numbers necessary to win this award, especially if he's on the top team in the conference. I'm going with our guy, Mongolian Mike. Mike yes, Sheriff jumps it. at San Francisco, uh, coming over from Dayton, 6'8". Uh, a great stylistic fit. Um, Jeff Borzello from ESPN says he thinks he's going to be the starting like point guard, mm-hmm. uh, ball in his hands. If so, I'm tuned in every night to see the Dons play a 6'8 point guard, distributing, <laughs> doing work. I'm all in. Although I guess I probably should pick Graham EK since I have him on my first team, but Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get names out there. I want people to know our man Mongolian, Mike, make Mm -hmm. sure you check him out. Andy, let's go next to freshman of the year. I'm going with Dusty Stromer Mm -hmm. at Gonzaga. I just think um, opportunity is going to be there. Mm -hmm. Uh, The highest rated freshman in the conference, but I will say keep an eye out for Niels Cooper at Mm -hmm. Pepperdine as well. I'm going with Kevin Patton at San Diego. No relation, by the way, but um, for me, I'm, I'm less confident in Stromer's playing time. Mark Few doesn't play freshman unless he absolutely has to. There's an argument that he might have to uh, because Gonzaga's depth is a little bit more limited, but I think he might be in a seventh, eighth man role, which just might, he, I think he's going to be good, but I'm not sure he's going to get enough playing time to win that award. Meanwhile, I think Kevin Patton's realistically starting for the Toreros next year. I don't know how great he's going to be, but I think he's going to put up the numbers necessarily to win this award. Makes a ton of sense. All right, last one. Sixth man of the year. I'm going Ben Gregg. I'm sticking with Gonzaga. Ben Gregg is going to come off the bench behind Graham E.K. and Anton Watson. He's going to be the third big. He was the third big last year, only played about 12 minutes per game. This year, I think he's going to be up 16, 17, 18 minutes per game. He shot 38% last year from deep. If he shoots around that, averages seven, eight points, that might be enough to win sixth man in this, uh, this conference this year. And I think he's a really talented young man. I'm going to go with Mason Forbes at St. Mary's, assuming he is coming off the bench, as you as we often talk about. Mm-hmm. We don't know at this point, but I just, after uh, transferring over from Harvard, redshirted mm-hmm. last year, think he's going to be a great asset to Coach Bennett's team this year. Folks, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to the show today. Always appreciate it. We love doing these conference previews. They're our absolute favorites. We got still a quite a few of them to go between now and the start of the college basketball season. So stick with us. We'll have conference previews three to four times per week. We also got some more fun stuff lined up for later this week. All right here on the Lockdown College Basketball Podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts. We are also available on YouTube. Go hit that subscribe button if you have not done so yet. Uh, Isaac, I'd love to get to 2000 before the start of the season. That may seem a little bold, but I think we can do it. So once again, if you're out there, uh, go hit that subscribe button on YouTube. It is much appreciated. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as always, peace out.